How to choose a record producer for a rock band. You would think this would be one of those really easy subjects, and a lot of people don't think there's much to this. But as you're going to hear in this episode, there's a lot more to it and a lot of thoughts that you probably haven't thought about. So what this is, is this is a discussion with my friend and business partner in the company Noise Creators that we used to have, Johnny Minardi. Johnny is now the senior vice president of A&R at Atlantic Electra Records and Fueled by Ramen, and he works with huge, huge groups like Grandson, Tones and I, and all sorts of these other monumentally huge groups. So Johnny also, though, has been a producer manager with his company, Self-Titled Management. So this podcast is actually three years old, but the funny thing is, is somebody told me they listened to it the other day, and they were like, this was, was totally fresh and new, they couldn't believe it was three years old, and I listened, and I was like, yeah, this is all evergreen advice, it hasn't changed at all. So the long and short of it is, I wanted to make sure it got the attention it deserves in this feed, because when any time you could find something that's that timeless, I think it's a good idea to re-up it. So... I decided to make this little intro, and I'm going to play it after. It's nice and short, and I think you'll enjoy it a lot. So I'm here today with Johnny Minardi. Johnny, how you doing? Doing great. How are you, my friend? I am all good. So we wanted to do this podcast because we've noticed after a year of doing Noise Creators that almost all the time we're seeing people with huge, huge misconceptions about booking producers. Even if somebody knows 90%, the 10% they don't know can sometimes be make a huge difference in how they plan and how well their record comes out. So we wanted to do something that really informed everybody about this. In this podcast, to run down what we're going to go through so that you know as you listen to this what you can expect, we're going to talk about how you choose a producer. We're going to talk about looking at their body of work, about how a producer and mixer fills in the blanks of a band, uh, what to look for in their credits, how much time do you take a book, a producer, do you do it by song or by day, could a producer come to you and do just as good job at their studio, should you do big blocks of time or should you just keep coming back every few weeks, do you need to be there to mix or master, what's up with test mixes and how do they make a record better, same thing with test masters, we're going to talk about deposits, producer points, and a whole bunch of other things. So we hope you stick around and listen to this. Uh, to get started, why don't we talk about how you choose a producer since that's the biggest thing we do. Let's talk about budget. Um, yep. One of the things I think you and I see all the time is that bands get used to the fact that some kid with a laptop in his parents' basement charges a bunch of money and they go, oh my God, well, I'll never be able to produce to go to a producer who's big. But what they don't realize is that those kids, once they get a computer, feel entitled to charge as much as a big producer a lot of the times. So right. let's get into a little bit of that. Yeah, I think that, like you said, in a little bit of the opening is that there's the misconception of always waiting till the next record. Or mm -hmm. we would have reached out earlier, but we didn't think we could afford so-and-so. Um, and that's not to undermine what the prices are. But like you're saying, you know, the local guys down the street are charging just as much. Um, and I've seen so many producer meetings go, hey, well, hey, I would have worked with you, but I didn't think I could have afforded you. Even for an extra couple thousand bucks, I could have had the guy that produced my favorite record. Damn, you know? Know? And it's like, that's something that I feel like, again, you always have to set what you're comfortable with spending. Um, but at the same time, it's always worth a conversation of, hey, we love, we, we sound like this. We love records like this. Who can you suggest that's within our range? And, and many of times, like, we'll come back and say, like, here's all these guys. And just so you know, here's a little bit more info on other guys that, you know, have done records in that genre that are a little bit more than that or whatever. Um, and I think that those suggestions kind of go a long way. Yeah. And like, I think like one of the funny things we've seen is it's like, it is that thing of like, you know, this guy is going to be $1,000 more to do your record. There's five of you, which means you, five, each of you come up with $200 more and you have a guy who literally worked on the majority of your favorite records versus the guy in parents basement who yells at you and doesn't do that great work <laughs> and like yeah, yeah. that can make a huge difference in how many people hear your music and how happy you are with your music right yep i think then the next important thing that we see a lot of the time is people don't know how to decipher credits so sure. let's go through um what a credit can mean so the thing I always like to say with producers is that they could do a lot or a little. Like, there's sometimes the best producer 
with a band who is really knows exactly what they want. They kind of just stay out of the way. Then there's also these producers who know so much. They're going to write harmonies, help you sh shape your songs and all this stuff. And there's so much in between there. Um, so one of the things I think that, you know, we've been trying to do when we help bands find the right fit is we try to figure out what they need in filling in their blanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you see in the differences between producers most of the time? Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about the guy with the laptop versus the guy with, you know, 50 big records or something in all the in-between. And it's, you know, a lot of a lot of guys start off as assistants or, you know, they're in the room with the producer making certain records. And then they kind of graduate and start to do a couple on their own. And then you kind of see them get into it fully on their own. Um, you know, and that's not to downplay the assistant one because that's all dependent on how fast that person learns or, um, you know, you might be that first record that they fully produce on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, that usually comes with different budgets. So if they if your budget's a little restricted, getting that guy that's worked on, you know, assisted on 10 of your favorite records, you know, it goes, Oh, Hey, we'd love to kind of take the opportunity and see if you were interested in doing it all on your own, you know, and you kind of start that world for that person. Um, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of that. And I think a conversation is always a good place to start with it because you don't know what they assisted on. You don't know if mm -hmm. they assisted for three days of two, of two months worth of recording, you know? So I think a lot of it, um, is just learning more about that, you know, whether it be even just listening back through some of the podcasts we've done already. I think that a lot of guys touch on how they work and how they got their start and how they operate now. So I think it's just a lot of research and, or reaching out for a conversation conversation and you know if there's something specific or if it's something general you know there's there's always a way to uh to to, to feel more confident with your decision is the important part i like that um i, I think that another thing you touched on is yeah every podcast we do i ask how much a producer likes to get involved in the songwriting and everybody does have a different answer for that i mean the most common answer is just they dip their toe in but not too much but right. There's always differences. I think you also make a great point about the assistance is like, I was somebody who, you know, I've assisted on huge, huge records. I've assisted yeah. on tons of records. And right. it's that thing of like, on some of them, it was like, literally, I was the guy who read the computer and plugged a few things in. And then on some of them, it's like the producer's out getting drunk and I'm running the session. And you yeah, kind of thing, right? You kind of never know until you talk to them and you see a body of work and you see consistently good work and the things that they're in charge of as well as what they've assisted it on. And I think that that's an important thing. That's sick. Yeah, no, that's a better way to wrap it up. And and again, I think it starts and ends with a conversation because that's, that's the way to find out. Um, so let's talk about then. So engineers usually are just in charge of tones. Now that doesn't always mean that everybody who has an engineer credit didn't help do some production because sometimes it's all a team and sometimes it's a thing, but this is also something you have to do investigative work on. So then there becomes the complicated thing of like mixers and mastering as well, right. because this is all a part of the sound and each one of them can have a part. Now, as somebody who does a lot of mastering, I will say this, that mastering is the equivalent of that. Yes, you can make it sound better, but if it sounds terrible, there's no mastering engineer <laughs> in the world who can make it sound like the best sounding record on earth. But a mixer right. can really, really revive some bad engineering. So you never know if the engineer slacked off and the mixer saved them or the engineer was great and the mixer did that. You don't know unless you look at a body of work. So let's actually go back to this filling in the blanks thing about how each producer is a little bit different from one another each time. One of the things I always think is important for bands to figure out, and we like to figure out with them, is really the expectation of what the producer-mixer-mastering engineer will do. Like, one of the things that we're very adamant about is that when we give you a rate for a mixer and mastering engineer, is that there is changes left in there for you to give some feedback, uh, and that you can have a say... One of the things I think we see is bands are kind of afraid to ask about how much input they can give when we think that they should be feel very open that their name is much larger in font than the producers. Sure. Yeah, I think, again, that's kind of like finding that comfortable confidence of, uh, you know, learning how many revisions or how nitpicky they can be. I mean, and I think we've seen the the whole scale of it. Like some sometimes bands are stoked on the first mix and don't say a word. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes bands need a couple of rounds and they're very like, you know, 
we really have a vision for the snare to be doing this. Can you please try to help that? You know, and they're very specific. So I think, you know, it's finding that conversation. Um, and ev- like, again, everyone on the site is very much like in the wheelhouse of you and I having the utmost confidence in them being the people that can be a two way street and have that conversation without being, you know, some of the horror stories we've heard of like, no, you've already got your revisions, move on, you know, and that's not at all how we operate. And that was an important thing that when we were vetting everybody to be on this site, we wanted to make sure that people were professional and did feel that way. You know, I have heard those horror stories and I've had to mix records for the people who, you know, it's like they, they say, well, you hired me to mix it and that's how I mixed it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's not okay. Yeah. So then they got to pay a second mixer to come in and actually remix it the way they wanted it. Yes. And so one of the other things that we pay attention to, too, is that, you know, everybody has that different level of songwriting that they want the producer to be involved in. Or even these days, some people think in the mix that the mixer is going to be adding keyboard parts and sub hits and string arrangements. And we try to discuss with you the truth about whether that mixer is up for that and then what that's going to cost, because... That costs a lot more than just mixing yeah. what they're given as composed yeah. to then writing on top of it. Absolutely. And I think that that's, you know, involved in the early conversation to be like, OK, what is your expectation? Is it strictly a mix master or is the is the mixer supposed to be reamping because we get those surprises mm-hmm. after? And, you know, we try to find a cordial way to be fair and have both sides understand what the expectation is. So price it accordingly. Um, so no one feels like basically the whole thing is like trying to make all of that be public and transparent so that everyone feels like they're getting a fair shake, whether it be the producer getting paid and putting in the time, or it's the band that's actually coming up with the money, um, that is wanting, you know, their goal. So I just feel like that, that, It's a conversation, again, much like everything. I feel like that's the reoccurring theme. Um, (laughs) And that's something that, you know, you should reach out about. If it is, if you don't know what you need and you just say, like, this is what my current stuff sounds like and I want it to sound like that, you know, then we fill in the blanks there. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing is that we can do, you know, you can hire people for pre-production, writing. Like, So the other thing with that is we've been doing tons of test mixing and test mastering. Do you want to explain that to everybody? Yeah, it's an interesting process process and I actually learned it when I was uh AR because I didn't know that stuff like this existed. Um and people would reach out and say like, hey, let me get a shot at mixing the next uh record by this band. And I'd be like, oh, interesting. Like that's you know, and we would send it to a couple different people and pick the best one. And then it was always like, well that's cool. You should why don't people do that all the time if they have the time or the budget for it. Um, you know, so what we've done recently to use some examples is someone's reached out and said, Hey, we've got a five song EP. This is our budget within our budget. We'd like to hear who you would suggest to mix it. And, you know, we've gone back and just said like, Hey, why don't we send it out to a couple, give you a little example of what's going on. And here's some people that I think would be interested in good for you and your genre. Um, and say they're all within your budget. And again, here's a couple people above your budget. If you wanted to hear what they wanted to do. Take it to a bunch of producers and send you um, unmarked song titles to where you literally don't know who mixed it. So you're taking it and saying, wow, here's these four mixes like B and D are my favorites. Like I, you know, this is great. Like give maybe give notes on one or or be like, OK, this person totally gets what we're going for. Um, we're going to proceed with that, you know, and you don't even know who it is yet. And then we come to you and say like, Hey, this was so-and-so, but it's almost like putting the song first and not the credits or not the, you know, Oh, this is the only guy we could afford. We better just go with them. And it's saying, here's examples of different ones and they come out very different. Um, you know, so it's almost cool to hear your song a few different ways. Um, like I said, we do that with mastering as well now too, which is very cool because a lot of people don't even know there are differences in mastering in a weird way. Yeah. And I think like one of the real interesting things we see with it is that it really is that thing of like, mostly with mixing is you can really see how much different somebody would imagine. It's usually so different than what the artist ever thought it was going to be like. The the reactions are just so intense of that you know you've been hearing it with one person's perspective on this and then hearing it and then even sometimes hearing the way other people thought of the song is something you sometimes use to reshape what the with the mixer that you actually did and right. use it. and it's like that thing of like oh i didn't realize that if the vocal 
has that reverb on it. That's actually something I'm really into. And you hear all this potential and you get it. Whereas with the mastering, I think so many times it's so hard for people to hear what the difference in mastering could be. But then right. when you have a few of them laid out in front of you, like, oh, these are my choices. One so obviously feels right for what your tastes are. Right. Yeah. And, and you could even like you kind of touched on, you're hearing it one way, hoping it sounds like this. I mean, you could send list of references that you're like, I love Bleed American. I love this. I love whatever it is and help kind of guide someone. Um, but at the same time, it's really cool when they have their fingerprints all over it. Um, and you might not like that. And you might find one that you do really like and you go that way. And it's just like you said, it's kind of suggesting things you didn't even know were available. Yeah. And I, I think like one of the other things that we should stress here is that one of the nice things we have is that you can do this in two different ways, is that some of our guys to do test mixes are going to need money to do a test, but some of them are looking to get into the game and get better proje projects, so they're going to do these for free for you. Yeah, and absolutely. You're going to have to pay for the person you choose to do the mix, you're going to have to pay to use that mix, and you're not... You're going to probably get a little bit of time chopped out of the mix. So you're not going to be able to just use that one and run or anything. But right. you get free perspective on this if you have it. And if you want better perspective, you have a budget. You can get tons of perspective from some, some really, really big popular mixers in the game. Right. And especially, yeah, you might get lucky at a certain time frame if uh, one of the bigger dudes is looking for work and had a cancellation and your, you know, song sounds like something that we send to them, that, you know, then they might even jump on board with it and say, you know, yeah, I'll take a little bit of a reduction. This band's cool. You know, so you never really know until you reach out. We've seen that happen. Yes, absolutely. How much time does it take to make a song? And this one is always dependent on so many things. You know, a fast punk band trying to do like an alkaline trio from here to infirmary, you know, they can do a record in five to seven days, whereas, you know, five to seven days to doing a full-length record for a Rise Core THX Core band is never going to happen. Not going to happen. What advice do you have for bands trying to figure out how much time it's going to take them to make a record? You know, it's I think certain producers kind of have their blueprint depending on style, um, and they, when, when it's when it's a discussion of, okay, this is the kind of band you are, kind of what you just said is, you know, then they'll come back with their, okay, this is what I propose a timeline would look like. So I think it's literally the comfortability of the producer. Um, cause there's been many times a band has reached out and been like, we think we can record 12 songs in six days, like you're saying. And a lot of producers get shaky and go, I don't think I can work on this project because the expectation is going to be something that I'm going to have a hard time pulling off in six days. Um, you know, and, and other guys I've worked with have said, well, I actually need, you know, three to four days of song to be comfortable. And it's like, oh, OK, because, you know, I think it's both sides of it to where it's it's got to depend on the style, like you're saying, because if it needs a lot of extra, you know, love or layers or keyboards or extra stuff, I think that that needs clearly needs more time than just that your, your three piece band, you know, Um so it, it depends on the style, it depends on the producer, and again, I think that that's an easy thing to find out once you kind of just say, hey, this is what we're trying, we're trying to accomplish five songs, well, what should we allot for that? Uh, agreed. So a lot of this is finding the fit. I think, though, you made a really good point that, like, is one of those things, like, when we're at the bar with the producer, we're laughing, is, like, there's one thing that really scares the producer is that the band says... We can do it in X amount of days. And I know a lot yeah. of people get, you know, really confident in their abilities and what they've done in the past. But what they don't realize is the reason that they like that producer's records is that producer usually has some methods at a time that makes the sounds that they get. And that's why you like what they're doing. Yep. And that's a great point. And saying that is kind of like saying to them, well, I'm going to impose my belief on your methods and you're still going to have to deliver a result. And like that, the second I read that personally, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be, yeah. Like, yeah. It's managing that expectation of like, okay, I can do it in that, but I'll, it's not going to sound like the record you referenced and why you want to work with me. That's yes. for sure. Yeah. And I think there, there is a happy medium. Sometimes it's like, there's tons of producers who can do it in 25% so less time. It's still do a killer job if the band's really prepared. And that's the right. other thing too, is, is like how prepared the band is, is going to be the greatest factor in that. And that, 
That's a good point. Cause even whether it be just pre-production in the studio or, Hey, we already have a Dropbox with the five songs in it. So you could even start with your, like you can, there's a way to work it out, but it, it, you know, the more work you put in on the band end, the better off the the more, the less reluctant a producer would be, I guess. It, it is always that thing of, um, there is, if there's one thing that makes every producer happy, it's being prepared. But then walking that fine line that you don't have everything so set in stone that nothing can be changed. There's a fine balance between those two things. Right. So one of the things that we get a lot too is, should I record by with a rate for per song or rate per day? You manage tons of producers and obviously through the site, we deal with so many people. What is your insight on that one? When it goes by day, there's always that blurry, well, am I getting charged for mixing days when I'm not there? Or, you know, what happens if we don't finish a song in the amount of days I booked? Then is it just incomplete or do I pay more? Like, I feel like when it's by song and there's a proposed schedule, there's a very clear, okay, this guy wants to do a, a song every two days. So five songs is 10 days. If we can't accomplish it in that song, clearly there's different circumstances with people getting sick or whatever it may be, but there's always a way to work out, you know, if you need to finish up after that or whatever, whatever the problem existed. But I always feel like it's pretty clear cut and the expectation then is set. Like here's the amount per days per song. This is what it's going to look like. This is our schedule. Um, and, and again, like I think that if a producer, then the expectations are managed where a producer knows like, okay, I only have 10 days with this band. I got to get it done. Whereas when it's by day, it's like, okay, I guess it could kind of be said the same way and flipped, but I always feel like when it's by day, it feels like it almost runs up and then you're racing the clock because you're basically saying, I need it done by these days or else I get charged another $500 per day for the next three days, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure how you operate at the studio, but again, I've done both very often. Um, I don't, I guess I can't say that one is better. I think that it, again, it comes down to managing the expectation and being saying, I'll, I'll do it by day, but if we don't finish, then it's another day, another day. Um, you know, then it adds up. So and again, the mixing has to be clear because I even recently had a band reach out and say like, well, hey, we paid X amount per day and our songs aren't mixed yet. It's like, well, they got to be mixed, right? Like yeah. <laughs> the, the day rate has to still, the clock steep keeps going. Like, well, we didn't plan for that. It's like, well, shit, we maybe we weren't too clear, but whatever it may be, like it was a, a buddy came to me and asked me that. So it was something I wasn't involved in and I just heard and I was like, well, they got to get paid per day. And he's like, well, they didn't say that up front. It's like, you didn't have the right conversation with that. Whoever is managing that producer. I'm not sure, you know, mm -hmm. kind of goes and, that route. Yeah. And I think that that's like one of the things is it's talking through expectations of what we're, we're involved in the conversation. We know these things, we've been through them so many times right. that we know not to let a thing like that happen. I have the, the feeling that it, a lot of times it's like, you know, the by day, um, by song can be a trap for the producer if right. it's going to be this constant thing of, well, I'm still writing in the studio and stuff like that. Like, that's not able to be a by song thing. If you're going to be writing forever, if you don't even know all the parts you're going to do, that can work. Um, a lot of time, what, I, what, what I'll work out as well, and I know you do too, is that it's like, it's by song, but here's the cap of days. And if your singer gets sick because he's been out getting drunk every night and smoking cigarettes, that's going to be you paying by the day after that. Th these days are exceeded. And having a, a structure in there that it, uh, quotes both is usually the most effective way. Sure. Yeah. And, and again, maybe you're right. Maybe it is something where it's like they they both have the cap on them in a sense, but the expectation is you'll be able to accomplish something. But then there's days, there's additional days if needed, if you're lucky enough and that producer has holes in the schedule too. Yes. Um, so another question we get asked a lot because – People can't always travel to where the ideal producer is. If you're in North Carolina and they're in Portland, Oregon, it may not be the easiest thing to do. What's been your experience with producers traveling to other studios? Um, it's 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 semi rare because obviously a lot of guys like to have their studio, but at the same time, some guys have kind of a mobile rig or can say, okay, well you're there. I know of a great studio there, or a friend of mine made a record there. Why don't I talk to them about? 
you know, maybe I can rent out that studio and it is easy for one person ideally to travel rather than five guys to drive across the country, you know, um, with all their gear and everything else. So I think that, you know, some guys are willing to do it. Some definitely aren't willing to do it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a conversation to be had or, you know, um, even very recently I've had people travel for a couple records. It's, it's actually, I think, becoming a little bit more, um, affordable because I think when they do build, whether it be a mobile rig or rent out a different studio, you know, you just have to be ready for that cost. Yes. Uh, and this is something I do a lot. And what I tend to find is, is just like, sometimes it is the thing that we are going to be able to, if we're looking at the budget, it is going to be infinitely cheaper for me to travel where the band is or do this somewhere right. else than what it is. Or my studio, you know, there's more than one of me who works at the studio. My studio's book, sometimes we need to go to another studio. And sure. that. I do think that most producers ideally want to work in their own space, but there can be total exceptions ever. Well, some of the guys we, we work with love to travel more than anything. They want to get out of their studio and have new, awesome experiences. So I think this is another one of those just to ask. If this is an idea that's on your mind, some producers are going to be open to it. Some producers are not going to be open to it. Right. And, and I think that, again, goes back to the budgeting to where it's like, hey, we only have X amount, but here's a, ser a scenario we dreamt up, you know, and it's like, oh, actually, yeah, why don't we have that conversation and let a producer make a decision? Or, and, you know, you might get the wrong answer, but you might say you might be surprised and be like, yeah, I'll come to San Diego for eight days, track your songs, and then take them home to mix them, you know? And, and some people, it's even the thing of like, it's like, um, I've done ones in the past where it's like the band has their own studio, but they're going to have to work their day jobs, except the one guy. So we do drums at my place. And then I right. head down to their place for 10 days, record the guitars, vocals, and bass. And then I come home and mix it. And we do it just for some of that because they have the home studio and their home studio is kind of actually ideal for that. And all is fine. We may bring an amp or a microphone from my place and a few right. preamps and then everything works out great. Yeah, that's awesome. So th with that, we also kind of got into uh, what it's like with these different schedules and accommodating them. Um, some bands get really scared that it's not going to be okay to just come in on, say, the weekends and work when they don't have to work or that they have to do 30 days in a row. Um, what have you seen in what matters like that for producers? It depends on the producer and their schedule, obviously, because there's some guys that are like, well, if you take the weekends, then I can't do a record for 30 days straight, you know, or whatever it may be. But for a certain band, for a certain time period, you know, it, it is feasible. And, you know, even when you're doing a single and you come in for two days here and then you do another single in three weeks or whatever it is, like there's always um, a way to fit it in. And some of the producers have cancellations that they're looking for for projects like that, that they're like, well, crap, like this whole record went away. Like I'm interested in doing however I have to do it for that band. You know, um, I, I've seen it all the different ways. Some guys only like to work in big blocks. Um, and then some guys are like, I'm flexible as hell. Like, let's do it. Yeah. And I, you know, if there's one conversation that I have with a lot of producers is that like the one advantage to not doing big chunks is like, you get a little bit of objectivity and a little bit of perspective back and you can see the project for what it is when it's not a every day in a row thing. And then some people are like, no, I need to live it and it's going to yeah. eat me up and it's going to make me insane. And it's all what that producer feels like and how they scheduled their time. I do this really commonly because I have to bounce back between so many different things that I really like it. But I also know I have a friend or two who are like, I, that would make me insane because once I'm on a project, I can't stand to think about anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, th that's true, too. I mean, it is a personal preference. And I think, you know, some guys like to just be really in the trench for 14 days straight and go, okay, wow, now I'm taking my head up for some air. Um, but like you said, it has its pros and cons both ways. So our next question is one I think we're going to easily agree on, which is, do I need to be there for the mix or the master? And the answer I would is say, no. No. <laughs> Uh, yes. If, if there's one thing that every pro producer, mixer, master now sa seems to agree about is it's better if you're not there. Um, right. In 98% of the cases, I'd say. Sure. And I think that a lot of bands think it's efficient to be there because they're like, well, I'm there. We could just make changes on the fly. But I don't think anyone, I mean, you writing a song, I don't think you'd want a producer over your shoulder while you're sitting you know, in your, you know, practice space or whatever it may be early on, you know, when they're really just getting their hands dirty, it, there's a certain, you know, 
level they want to take those mixes to before they even show you because you're going to critique it until it gets there anyways. So I think that you kind of just give them space. Very rarely, like you said, if you are under certain circumstances, sure, it's happened. I think uh, most don't prefer it, though, and you probably get uh, more focus on that so they're not feeling someone sweating on their back. Yeah, and that doesn't mean you don't come back for the changes, but I think the yeah. other real key thing, especially with mixes and mastering, is is that you're not used to how their control room sounds, how their speakers sound, and all these things, and that it's so much better for you to be in your environment, listen back, and give the notes. And it's one thing if you do want to come back to do specific things, like you know you have a whole array of how you want to cut up a vocal for a part or something like that, and you mm -hmm. need to do that at some point, that's a totally different story, but the majority of the mixing and mastering, especially mastering, seems to be done best by giving notes by you hearing what's most familiar on your system since the yeah. way recording works best is you making judgments on something you're familiar with, not on something that you've never heard before. Right, yeah. Good way to put it. So let's get into some of the other tiny little things that people don't understand about uh, booking a producer. Uh deposits. Yeah, I think generally most guys are either 33% or 50% and, you know, they that's just kind of make them be confident that your project is going to happen and, you know, that you need that to actually book time on their calendar because many a times there's bands that, oh no, I'll get it to you next week, I'll get it to you next week and then go cold and and run the other way and then that producer is like, well, there goes the back end of March and I passed on a couple projects I wanted to do because I thought the span was coming. So, um, you know, and each one of them is booked a certain time in advance. So that putting that deposit down allows you to guarantee yourself that slot with that producer or mixer. Yes. And we should say, so that's usually 33 to 50% of the total budget for the record. Right. Um, that's an anticipated thing. It doesn't always mean the final bill will be that if you go over time or anything, but it's just to say, I'm going to hold the amount of time we agreed on to do this. And, you know, it really helps because like, you know, I've had, in the past uh, 15 years, I've had two different drummers break their legs. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, and then without that deposit, it's like I could be out of business. It's right. like, can't do the record with the drummers uh, in, in, in a sling for the next six months. And, sure. you know, bands break up, people have personal things happen. This yep. is to ensure that happens. It's to just say you're serious about this. So with that, how long do people usually need to book in advance and give this deposit do you see on average? I would say a couple months. I would say two to four months. Somewhere in there, is a, there's a sweet spot. Again, there's differences with cancellations and you know other things. And some guys are booked a year in advance. So, um, But yeah, I think there's a, a good sweet spot right there. Um, and, and you can kind of, depending on what the project is too, if it's a one song mix, clearly, you know, that can get turned around a lot faster than recording 12 songs front, to, you know, front to back. Agreed. Um, and yeah, that's about, I think that you, you, you hit it there, that eight weeks is the, probably the most common. And then it gets a little bit more as people are busy. Um, right. The busier the guy, basically the longer it's going to be. So it's sure. good to reach out as you're planning your record kind of as soon as possible to figure out if you're going to be able to get in with it. The earlier you start having this conversation of figuring out, do I need to deposit eight weeks in advance or 16, that's a really yep. big difference. Yep, big time. And you might miss the boat on that. So, Jai, you have one of the rarest qualifications in the business, which is that you are both an A&R man and a producer manager. So that means you actually understand points from both sides. <laughs> yes. No it one is, is no one is more qualified than you to answer this question oh, of explaining boy. points and what the hell that means, because I know yeah. so many bands like you know that the, they they when when I talk about the points in my contract they they don't know if that means I'm going to be coming to their in the night and yes. stealing their baby's teeth from them <laughs> or what. It is a very it has become more widely accepted, but yes, for a while it was very like you the people stop calling you back when you ask for a couple points on their on their royalties there. But it is very much not a scary thing. It is only something that the producer makes money when you make money. It's never, you know, oh, we owe him extra money even though we didn't sell any copies of this. Um, when you're on a label, clearly you have a whole team of people that handle that for you. But when you're an independent band and a producer asks you for points, it is not a scary thing. It is very easily calculated 
And depending on what sort of agreement or how many, you know, it is or how many records you sell and where you sell them and what you're being paid for, when you do your, you know, your back ends on whatever service you prefer to use, um, they give you those statements and they say, you made X amount of dollars off these songs. And it's very easy. Well, let's, but- drill, let's drill that, uh, down on that a bit, because I think that that could be something people get lost on, is that when you go into TuneCore, CD Baby, DistroKid or whatever... You yep. can make a report of how much you've sold. Sure. And at a certain sales marker, that's going to mean you owe this producer some points. Right. Yeah. So basically, a lot of points don't start until things are fully recouped. Um, so, so if you spent yeah, – dr- Drill that. Drill down on that. Yeah. If, if you spent if you spent ten grand with this producer to make your record, you you know the first ten grand basically goes to you. Like you get that back. Um, and then from there you start, what if the agreement was four points on the producer side, if you're an independent band and putting it out yourself, that's literally 4% of the money you make. Um, I guess it's always literally 4% of the money you make, but your portions are different if you're signed to a label and your royalty rate is 16% and then they get 4% of that. Um, but yeah, it's basically if a point is a percent is the easiest way to describe and you know pull the curtain back on why what it is. Um, so if you make ten thousand back, then you're back to even, and then from there, every dollar that comes in, that producer gets four cents. It's just as simple as that goes. And if you make a million bucks, then you're probably not going to care too much about paying that producer. But for some reason, it is a very scary thing. And like you said, a lot of people turn and run the other way. And it's not. They only make money when you make money. And it should also be said, too, that the reason a producer is getting points is that oftentimes this is for a discounted rate. That what they factored in is I'm going to charge what's called $1,000 a day just for fun because it's a round number even though yeah. most of our producers are nowhere near that much <laughs> no, money a day yeah, yeah. um yeah. just to make the math easy is that what they really would have been doing is they would have been charging 1250 a day but what they're saying is instead is i'm going to take a leap of faith on you and say i'm going to defer this money but you're going to pay me this because i'm going to do a good enough job and my contributions to this are going to be good enough that you give this to me um yep. And that really is as simple as points are. And I know that sometimes that seems scary, unfair, because we, you know, it's so easy to hear about the horror story of Mariah Carey being robbed of her rights in some book. But like (laughs) in this day and age, the robber barons are not in the music business as much because they go to businesses where there's much more money to be made. Right. If you're and they're 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 not on our side either. So. Yes, yes, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. we would not allow the robber baron to be there, yeah, and and true. we've seen there is people we've decided to to not go near because they've decided to do things like that. Yes, and because of that, anybody who's doing this, you're getting an honest, honest price on the points. Yes. And, and, a, and, a, it, and a, a industry standard. Right. And it's agreed upon and understood on both ends that it's a fair shake and it's not feeling taken advantage of. That's, again, the number one point of the entire site is to hopefully manage the expectations and everyone feel like they got what they expected and they're very excited to move forward and ideally come back again. And we should also say this, that what would you say? It's like probably like even somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the guys on our site don't take points. Yeah, I would say, yeah, it's a conversation to be had. It depends on, again, if you need, hey, we're a little short, maybe some guys take it more points. Or mm-hmm. if you say like, hey, really, you know, whatever it is. And I also want to say too, like some people don't, they, they want points just because they believe in the band and in the sense of like, oh, here's my rate. But I also do points because I, you know, I'm a part of this team. I'm a part of this project. Um, you know, so some guys, it, it's on both ends. That's a great point. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's tons more like this that are about to come up on the end screen, or you can click a link in the description below to see more like it. As well, if you want to hear more like this in your favorite podcast app, just search Noise Creators, and all of my podcasts are in that feed there. As well, if you're a musician who's trying to go from 0 to 10,000 fans, I have a playlist linked below or on the screen in a second that's all about how you do just that, where I have tons and tons of videos on how you grow your fan base as a musician who hasn't yet established themselves. So please click that subscribe button and get notified to all my videos, and stay tuned for even more content just like this. Thanks so much for watching.